Okay, so the last, hopefully, <laughs> the last section on muscles, um, we're going to talk about the trunk muscles. So we talked about the head and neck muscles. Um, we're going to go into the trunk muscles now. So um, the anterior muscles of the trunk, everybody's favorite muscles, right, the abs, um, we have matching pairs, one on each side, of rectus abdominis, external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis. We have those four layers of abdominal muscles. Um, they're often referred to just as a group, abdominals. Um, they provide an important source of mobility and stability to the trunk. Most of them, except for the transverse abdominis, decrease the distance between the xiphoid process of the sternum and the pubic bone. They rotate and or laterally flex the trunk. So they um, do flexion, rotation, and lateral flexion. Okay. So um, everybody's favorite muscle, rectus abdominis. I don't know if it's everybody's favorite, but <laughs> we all have a six-pack. Just some people you can see it and some people you can't. Um, it originates at the pubis and it inserts on the costal cartilages of ribs 5, 6, and 7 and the xiphoid process. Rectus, of course, you know, means strap, and it's, so it's that strap of muscles that goes up both sides. Um, the, in, the, in between the rectus abdominis is a line of connective tissue that's called the linea alba. Linea alba just means white line. And um, it, um, there are some dysfunctions of the linea alba where it becomes um, separated. It's called diastasis recti. Um, sometimes it happens after pregnancy because um, it gets super stretched. Um, sometimes it happens after injury, um, and it, it can be treated, so yay. Um, the action, of course, of the rectus abdominis is trunk flexion and compression of the abdomen, and it's part of the force couple for posterior pelvic tilt, along with the, um, the hip extensors and the rest of the abdominal muscles except the transverse abdominis. And it gets intercostal nerves. So you can just think of that as nerves in the area. Um, the, the external oblique is the next deepest layer. So the rectus abdominis is the most superficial layer of abdominals. Go one layer deeper and you get the external obliques. The fibers form a V. So if you take your hands, point your fingers down in the form of a V, um, it, they, the um, external obliques attach from, they originate the lateral sides of ribs 4 through 12, um, where they interdigitate with the attachments of the serratus anterior. And if people are lean enough, you can see that nice little zigzag line that that causes. And they insert on the iliac crest and the linea alba. So they go, they have that oblique line of pull from lateral to medial, and that gives you your um, rotation and then they, um, it also gives you flexion because it goes from superior to inferior. So bilaterally, you get trunk flexion, compression of the abdomen, and it's part of the force couple for posterior tilt. Unilaterally, you get lateral flexion and lateral flexion to the same side and rotation to the opposite side of the contralateral side. So put your fingers on your iliac crest and your ribs and rotate to the opposite side and see what happens. Or get out a rubber band or a TheraBand and see what happens. Um, intercostal nerves 8 through 12, a couple other nerves, we'll just say nerves in the neighborhood, innervated by nerves in the neighborhood. The next deepest layer down are the internal obliques and they form an inverted V. So, <coughs> pardon me, um, they originate um, on the inguinal ligament and iliac crest and thoracolumbar fascia, and they um, course um, obliquely and superiorly to ribs 9 through 12 in the linea alba. So they, they sort of crisscross with the external obliques. So bilaterally, they do trunk flexion and abdominal compression, and they're part of the force couple for posterior tilt, just like the rectus and the external obliques. Unilaterally, they do lateral bending and rotation to the same side. So put your hands on your um, body in an inverted V and see how that rotation to the same side shortens the internal obliques. Um, same nerves as the external obliques. Nerves in the neighborhood, we'll call it. 
the deepest layer of abdominal muscles is your transverse abdominus. Um, it is the only one that does not have a line of pull for flexion. When you look at that fiber direction, it goes, it's a transverse fiber direction. It is also the only layer of your abdominal muscles that has a physical connection to your lumbar vertebrae through the thoracolumbar fascia. So um, it originates on the inguinal ligament, iliac crest, and the thoracolumbar <coughs> fascia of the last and the last six ribs, and it swoops around to the linea alba. Okay, so I call your transverse abdominis your built-in UPS belt. Some people call it the corset muscle because when that muscle contracts, it compresses the abdomen like tightening a corset. Um, when, when your Pilates teacher tells you to core up, you're tightening your transverse abdominis. You're stabilizing. It's a huge, huge, huge stabilizer muscle. Um, we love the transverse abdominis. We train it a lot in PT because a lot of people do not use their transverse abdominis. They just wear it. So we want to train them to use it to stabilize their spine. Nerves in the neighborhood, intercostal nerves and um, iliohypogastric and iliolingual um, nerve, um, inguinal nerves. Um, but the transverse abdominis, it's a big player in spinal stabilization. Um, other functionally associated muscles to the, um, to the abdominals are the iliopsoas and the quadratus lumborum. Um, we talked about the iliopsoas in the hip chapter as one of our major hip flexors. It's a combination of the iliacus and the psoas major. It's a primary hip flexor, but it also plays a role in other motions of the trunk and pelvis because of where it attaches. And we'll look at the attachments in a minute. And the quadratus lumborum attaches inferiorly to the iliac crest and superiorly to the 12th rib and transverse processes of L1 through L4. Bilateral activation of the muscle results in slight extension of the lumbar spine. It is a very midline muscle, so a lot of it, um, it uh, provides um, vertical compression. We'll look at the insertions in a minute. The quadratus lumborum and the psoas major run nearly vertical on either side of the lumbar vertebrae. So strong bilateral contraction of the muscles provides vertical stability through the entire base of the spine, including the L5-S1 junction. So these guys, even though they have other jobs, they also moonlight as stabilizers. And they're very important. So um, these guys, they're doing a lot of work for us in our um, lower body and trunk. So the quadratus lumborum, it's very deep, located in the anterior posterior midline. So um, very midline sort of muscle originating on the iliac crest and going up to rib number 12 and the transverse processes of L1 to L4. So bilaterally, it does have a little bit of a line of pull for extension, but it does more of that vertical stabilization. Um, unilaterally, um, in closed chain, it does trunk lateral bending in open chain, you get hip hiking or elevation. So if you have a long leg cast or a fused knee, you have to hike that hip in order to clear that foot when you're walking. The quadratus lumborum, or the QL for short, is your, is your guy. That's the muscle that's going to help you with that hip hiking motion. So um, it gets spinal nerves T12 and L1, so nerves in the neighborhood. The iliopsoas, also in that same neighborhood, um, transverse processes of T5, T12 through L5 and the iliac fossa, um, and it inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. Um, it does trunk flexion and anterior pelvic tilt and hip flexion. Um, and it gets the femoral nerve like all the other hip flexors. So um, it, you can see how it has the line of pull for um, all those things. The other interesting thing about the iliopsoas is, is particularly the psoas portion, um, it can participate a little bit in trunk extension, even though it's a, it can be a trunk flexor. It can be a trunk extensor when the upper body's fixed and the, and the lower body's fixed. And the iliopsoas, you do a slight anterior pelvic tilt to get into more lumbar lordosis. So it can, it can help with um, lumbar extension as well as trunk flexion. So it's a it's a muscle of um, many talents. So the iliopsoas. So in analyzing a sit up, and they um, this there's a box in the book that goes through this, which is kind of interesting. 
So the abdominal muscles um, bring the xiphoid process toward the pubis and flatten the lordotic curve of the lumbar spine. Um, this phase of the sit-up, you can think of it as the curl phase, concludes as the scapula clears the supporting surface. Once you start to, to now move into a full sit-up, the hip flexor muscles rotate the pelvis and attach trunk anteriorly, drawing the chest closer to the knees. So that's one of the reasons why when you're doing um, full sit-ups for a physical fitness test or something, somebody holds your feet. So your hip flexors don't draw your knees towards your chest. They draw the chest closer to the knees. Your feet will be fixed. So um, the, the curl part is the abdominal muscles, and then the rest of the sit-up is the hip flexor muscles. Can you tell by my voice that I'm doing these actions as I'm doing them? So when you're doing a, um, an oblique crunch, the um, external obliques and the internal obliques actually um, act synergistically. Um, so the abdominal muscles are contracting frequently to produce a combination of movement involving all three planes. So we're doing some flexion, some rotation, um, and some lateral flexion, and they're assisted by the muscles of the posterior trunk as well. So when you're doing, um, and uh, try it out, and we'll we have, we have a lab activity where we're going to try this out. If you're doing an oblique crunch, try to figure out which side of the internal obliques is contracting and which side of the external obliques are contracting. They're different. So the posterior muscles of the trunk include the erector spinae, and I think it's hilarious that, um, well, I don't know if it's hilarious, but <laughs> you have to be easily amused. In the book, they talk about the erector spinae as being a large, disorganized group of muscles that run essentially vertically on either side of the spine, So, um, which is sort of true <laughs> when I think of it that way. Um, there is a, a box on the book, um, a box in the book on page 222, that talks about um, abdominal strengthening, which is a lovely little box if you want to visit that. Um, the erector spinae group, as a group, they extend and stabilize the vertebral column and the craniocervical region, so they run from top to bottom. And there's three thin columns of muscles, the spinalis, which is next to the spine, it's the most medial, the longissimus, which is the longest, and the iliocostalis, which goes from the hips, the ilium, to the ribs, the costal um, portion. So their names kind of give it to you. Spinalis is close to the spine, longissimus is the longest, and iliocostalis goes from the ilium to the ribs. Okay? So um, in the book they have the uh, chart with the, all the attachments and everything. They're, they're all innervated by dorsal rami of adjacent spinal nerves. Um, I'm not going to expect you to know the individual um, origins and insertions of these, but um, just their general actions. These are, this is the listing of them all. You can see they're all pretty small. It's all local spinal nerves that do it. Um, and know that these guys are, when we talk trunk extensors, these are them. Or, you know, they're part of it. And so they act as part of the force couple with um, anterior pelvic tilt between the trunk extensors and the hip flexors. Um, let's go a layer deeper. So the, um, the erector spinae group are the most superficial of the um, trunk extensors. Now let's go a layer deeper. We're going to be talking about the transversal spinale muscles. So the transversal spinale muscles, they are three different groups, three different lengths, if you want to think of them this way. So the semispinalis, they're the longer ones. They span six to eight vertebral junctions. Um, the multifidy are the medium ones. They span two to four. And the, ro uh, the rotators or rotatories um, span one to two interspinal segments. They lie deep to the erector spinae. There's your muscle relationship. And they course in an oblique direction from one vertebra's transverse process to the spinous process of a vertebra above. So I was saying the splenius capitis and splenius cervicis sort of go up and out like a poplar tree. The transversal spinales go down in pairs like an evergreen tree. So we have our little um, evergreen tree on the back of our spine. 
Um, and they are, um, they provide stability and rotation at each of these levels. So all of the transversospinal muscles extend the vertebral column when they um, contract bilaterally. The oblique fiber direction um, also equips them to produce contralateral rotation because the spinous process moves towards the transverse process. So you get contralateral rotation. The more horizontal and shorter the muscle, the greater its potential to produce horizontal plane rotation. Okay, so the rotatories are rotators. Your name gives it to you. And the, um, the long, when you get to longer, semispinalis has more extension capability, if that makes sense. So if you think of these, they're a deeper group. Erector spinae is the most superficial. These guys are the next deeper. And they are extensors and rotators. Um, so this is the, the deepest, um, deepest layer, transverso spinalis. Um, the, the details, transverse processes to spinous process above. You can think of it that way. So then we have these itty bitty little short segmental muscles. The intertransversaries and the interspinalis. So their names tell you what they do. The intertransversaries go between the transverse processes. So they go from one transverse process to another and one transverse process to another. They assist with lateral flexion. So those little motions where each segment contributes, each intertransversaris contributes to the lateral flexion. Um, so it's fine control over the, the vertebral column and vertical stability in the sagittal and frontal planes. And we get a lot of sensory feedback from these muscles that are essential for proprioception and postural alignment. So these guys are itty bitty little posture muscles. You can think of them that way. Um, so the interspinales go between the spinous processes. So from one spinous process to the one above, one below to the one above, they do trunk extension. Because you move the spinous processes closer together, you extend the trunk. They're also postural control, and they're innervated by the spinal nerves in the area, in that segment. So um, just think of these as your little tiny control muscles. So segmental versus gross stabilization. Each muscular column crosses a lot of intervertebral segments that has gross control over extension. So those big erector spinae muscles, gross control over extension. The transversal spinale muscles course obliquely across relatively few intervertebral segments, and they exert a more refined multidirectional control over the vertebral column. And the deep segmental muscles cross only one segment, and they have the most precise control over the vertical column. So we go from gross stabilization of the erector spinae to fine, precise control of the deep segmental muscles. So um, a lot of times, in, in particularly if you're working in an outpatient clinic, you might be working on someone in a, a return to work or functional capacity evaluation, and we're teaching them correct versus incorrect lifting. So if you use optimal lifting techniques, it allows you to share forces between the low back and the muscles of the arms, legs, and trunk. Incorrect lifting concentrates a lot of the force demands directly on the low back. So lifting incorrectly with a flexed or rounded lumbar spine increases stress on the muscles and joints and intervertebral discs and it increases risk of the injury. So we want to um, encourage people to maintain their lumbar lordosis when they're lifting. Um, and then another way to say that is stick your butt out when you lift. So in summary, the vertebral column is involved with a lot of functions that are essential to normal kinesiology of the body. Damage anywhere along the vertebral column. If you damage one multifidus muscle, um, you, have, you might have a problem. Um, anywhere along the vertebral column can um, result in a spinal cord injury and subsequent quadriplegia or paraplegia. Um, physical therapy is often the first line of conservative treatment for pain and dysfunction of the vertebral column. Um, in a recent continuing ed class I did on low back treatment, 84% of people, of adults, have low back pain sometime in their life. Um, of, those, of that 84%, um, most people recover 
without any intervention within a few weeks. Um, a smaller percentage of that, about 15% of those people, um, go on to have chronic low back pain. Um, so many of these people we see in a PT clinic. Chronic low back pain is something that um, you are going to learn to treat in your orthopedics class because you will see it in every setting you work in. So very important area of physical therapy.